Uh, hello and welcome to our Bible study today. We're continuing on with the book of Isaiah, looking at uh, chapter 44. This is our third part for chapter 34, uh, 44, and we're starting with verse 21. Uh, I'm Reverend David Matthews, and today again, I, we, I am with the Reverend Nancy Springer, and uh, we're very glad to be able to uh, do this study with you. Uh, we're reading from the Common English Bible. So Nancy, will you please uh, start us off again? Verse, uh, chapter sure. 44, verse 21. Beginning in 21, right. Remember these things, Jacob, Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. I won't forget you, Israel. I swept away your rebellions like a cloud and your sins like a fog. Return to me because I have redeemed you. Sing heavens for the Lord has acted. Shout depths of the earth. Burst out with a ringing cry, you mountains, forests, and every tree in it. The Lord has redeemed Jacob and will glorify himself through Israel. The Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb, says, I am the Lord, the maker of all, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the omens of diviners and makes a mockery of magicians, who turns back the wise and turns their knowledge into folly. But who confirms the word of my servant and fulfills the predictions of my messengers? Who says about Jerusalem, it will be resettled? And who says about the cities of Judah, they will be rebuilt and I will restore their ruins? Who says to the ocean depths, dry up, I will dry your streams? Who says about Cyrus, my shepherd, he will do all that I want? Who says about Jerusalem, she will be rebuilt. And who says about the temple, you will be founded again. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, Nancy. Well, continuing on with our reading here, uh, I did have a question about uh, verse 22. It says, I swept away your rebellions like a cloud and your sins like fog. Return to me because I have redeemed you. Doesn't that, isn't that the wrong order is why is it returned to me because I redeemed you? It shouldn't it be returned to me and I will redeem you? Well, that's what we would expect, right? In our human transactional interactions mindset, um, that's exactly what we would expect. Um, but that's not how God works. God's grace is always offered and available. Um, we come to God to receive it. Um, and it's but it's already there. So God says, I have redeemed you. That act, the act of God's already done. Um, and so he's saying, return to me and receive this gift that I have given you. Um, yeah, looking so at I, it from, oh, go ahead. No, so I'm just saying, so as Christians, our understanding of that Jesus has performed the act of justification, has sacrificed upon the cross, this redemption, it's already happened. And so this language that we use for that act, and then we can return and to receive the gift of grace, that language already exists in the Old Testament before Jesus. Right, yeah. And it's, you know, God's, God gave us linear time because that's what our human brains can grasp. <laughs> but for God, the creator of all things, including time, um, there is, no time to God all things are now um, and so to say return to me because I have redeemed you right? God's plan all along has been redemption and for us to return so yeah that um, it it means the same in the Old Testament language as it does in our New Testament language um, Paul says that you know while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. There was no, he didn't do it because we said we were sorry. Christ died for everyone, for all sin. And it's a gift that we can receive. Mm -hmm. So there still is the reception of the gift present, but it's already been laid out. So yeah. in, in verse 23, then this is the response or the appropriate response then of the actual reception of the gift, right? The singing. Mm -hmm. So 
there still is that joy, but the joy comes once the pe person has received the gift. And so, so the, if you will, there, the gift has been laid out, although the person doesn't know that the gift is there for them. Yeah. And sort of like a Christmas present under a tree without your name on it. You don't know yeah. that it's for you. <laughs> you know, there's a present there, but you know, it could just be an empty box. You don't even pick it up and shake it even. It could be something in it. Yeah. But if it's not yeah. for you, you're not emotionally connected. Once someone says, this is for you, you then unwrap it excitedly. You see it as something you love. And then you burst into either thanks, song, whatever. I don't know too many musicals that have started with the unwrapping of a Christmas present, but I feel like there should be one. <laughs> uh, but that sense, right? It's it's that is the response for the reception of the gift yeah and that joy is so great that all of creation sings out with it right um right sing the heavens shout the depths of the earth right the mountains the forest and all the trees are even singing along because the lord has redeemed jacob and will glorify himself through israel right there's no action on Jacob's part, God's already done it. There's no action on Israel's part, the people of Israel. God has done it and, and offering this invitation to receive the gift. Come and get this glorious gift. Mm -hmm. And that goes back into our talk the other week um, that sin isn't just your sin, but when one person sins, death comes into the whole world. Uh, wow. When I sin, I some people just say, you know, you know, it, my own choices, what am I, who am I hurting, right? I'm not hurting anybody else. And through Adam and Adam's sin, we recognize that sin doesn't just come into one person's life, but comes into the entire world, that everything through Adam's action was broken. Um, and it's through this that everything has been knocked off of its uh, proper course, its rails. Uh, and, and so the heavens are rejoicing. Everybody is, everything is rejoicing when Israel comes back on track, when Jacob does here, because that's a sense, if you will, that that, that damage through that sin and through that death won't be. Um, and so it reminds me, of course, of the Jesus's line of the, that, that there'll be much rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, right? Yeah. And it's, it's that idea of, when the when the sinner repents then death is not entering the world anymore don't get me wrong death is still in the world currently and we're being redeemed and transformed and there will come a day when that's fixed but it's that that faucet for death entering the world has been turned off yeah and so that's why the whole world rejoices that's that's excellent that's a very powerful thought yeah yeah so, so we, I was gonna say, we just, we go on into the, this very common, um, we've referenced it several times, right? This, this God reminding us of who God is, right? He does this to Job and he does it to Jonah and right. And over and over again, that you know, I'm the one that formed you, right? The maker of all things. I alone stretched out the heavens and the earth and and frustrates right the omens of the diviners right so in the previous section where we talked about the idols and that the only thing idols can be made of is the stuff that god already made right um we can't create from nothing this is just god continuing that message of understanding who god is and that makes that gift all the more glorious mm -hmm. right all the more joyful because the very God that created us, knowing we would mess up, um, loves us and wants to be in relationship with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of power to that as well, because this description of God isn't just saying his name, right? I can tell you my name is David. And you can even look for meaning in the name of David and what, you know, means beloved friend and these things. But just to hear my name doesn't mean you know me, but this descriptor of the Lord, your redeemer, who formed you in the womb says, 
this is giving, laying out the people's experiential knowledge of God. You can trust me because I am your redeemer. So therefore, you know how I will act in the future. You know me from this experiential uh, experience we went through together. So therefore, you can trust me to do that again and walk with me through that. And so the God saying this and laying out that experience firsthand is helping the people to then know with, with fullness and security what's coming next mm -hmm. and be able to trust in God for that. Yeah. yeah. So Nancy, here we come to verse 28 and here's a little bit of a difficulty we have again, because in verse 28, it says, who says about Cyrus. Now, Isaiah, from our understanding, is written during the time of King Hezekiah. Now, there's breadth on both sides before and after of Isaiah's life, but Cyrus is not for a couple hundred years after that. Cyrus is a Persian king, and we're not expecting Isaiah to have lived a couple hundred years. He's not, you know, some prophet from before the time of Noah. He presumably lived a long life and then dies. So my question here is, what is going on by the mention of Cyrus? And also about this idea of who says about Jerusalem, she will be rebuilt and about the temple, you will be founded once again. The temple doesn't get destroyed until 587 BC, 586, under uh, the Babylonian invasion. And that's still before Cyrus. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah is before that. Isaiah dies, presumably, before the Babylonian invasion. So how on earth is this in this book? What's going on? Well, there's lots of possibilities, right? The, um, it could be a vision that Isaiah is having hundreds of years before it happened. But more than likely, I think the more logical explanation is that I, you know, there are multiple Isaiah's writers of Isaiah, not multiple Isaiah's, but this is put in later. It's, it's put in a scroll already written um, to emphasize the power of God, right? That God not only created all the earth, not only can frustrate omens of diviners and magicians, but God can use foreign kings to bring about his purposes because God's purposes aren't just for the people of Israel, but for all of creation and the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, the writer who put this in more than likely had the intent of that message mm -hmm. um, of showing that, you know, from, from the covenant with Abraham, where God promises to bless all of the nations through Abraham. If Israel as a people group have fallen out of step and are not being the conduit of the blessing to the world, that's not going to stop God. Right? God's going to keep blessing the nations, even with using foreign kings mm -hmm. and foreign and peoples. And whether this is, in fact, a prophetic vision that the man Isaiah has, the prophet Isaiah, and he talks about this thing that's going to happen in the future, or if this is something that's added in later by one of Isaiah's students after Isaiah's death, that doesn't affect this key point. And right. that point is that God will redeem Israel, and he will use anything and everyone to do it. And also mm -hmm. that God, through Israel is redeeming the entire world. That was the promise to, to bless the entire world through Abraham and his descendants. And so, and of course, we as Christians believe that the, uh, the realization of that original prophecy to Abraham, that declaration of God to Abraham, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, both Jesus as he came through the spirit as was gifted to us and came at Pentecost, as well as through Jesus's coming again. And so we, it, it finds its fullness in Jesus. But again, whether this writer is, is a prophetic vision, this point, or it's not, that point still stands that 
God is redeeming through this foreign agent, again, for the purpose of Israel to become what they were originally created to be, to fulfill their created purpose. Yeah. And I love the way you said that you used redeeming rather than past tense or future tense, right? It's a, it's a continuous action, right? God is continually acting in this world um, to bring about his purpose and plan. And, and redemption is an ongoing thing um, as, as God, through us, right? We are now the conduit through which God um, restores the world to his intent, right? Um, Bishop Michael Curry uses the phrase to, to turn the world from the nightmare it often is into the dream that God intends. Mm-hmm. And so and that's, our, that's our role in all of this. Mm-hmm. A- absolutely. And we all want to step into that created purpose of God because God's vision for us is far greater than any vision we can have for ourselves. To become what God intended us to be is the brightest, most brilliant, shiny that I will be um, and could ever hope to be. And so we want to become that person. However, um, we of course are all tempted and you know, thus have gone astray as the line is, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, but we are on that path of salvation, on that path of, although we have been justified, we are still being mm-hmm. sanctified, still being the process of redeemed. Although if we were to die, you know, along this journey, God, as is, says um, through Paul, will finish the good work that he started in us. And so that's the understanding of the journey yeah so nancy we're looking at this and we've see, we see uh we see this idea then of she will be rebuilt and who says about the temple you will be founded again so we understand that the temple falls and is destroyed but this seems to depict something of god's uh whether it be through Jesus or through the rebuilding of the second temple, there's still this importance of that sacred space, that sacred Mm -hmm. place where we meet with God and that will be restored. Um, As a Christian, you know, how does that, how does that affect us? How does that, that idea of the place where God meets us, how does that manifest? God now God meets us within our own humanity. Um, you know, Jesus came to, to live and die as one of us, right? To reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all, right? What we say in the Eucharistic prayer. Um, God meets us in our humanity and says, um, this is now my temple. You are, we are the, the place of God's presence on earth. And so through Jesus coming, that, that shifted from a literal building and place, the temple of Jerusalem, to be all who follow Jesus. And so important to note, of course, is that throughout history, uh, the Jewish people struggled with oppressors and, well, even their own priests at times, setting up unchristian practices, sorry, un on Jewish practices, ungodly practices in the temple, and even um, their oppressors setting up idols and statues to other gods within the temple as well. And so the temple does need to be purified and cleansed itself. And so as we recognize that that is in the Christian context, that you are a temple, that you are the temple of God, that needs to be, that that's needs to be sanctified and purified and continually redeemed because that's the process of you becoming uh, i don't want to say more like him but purified unpolluted cleansed to be that pure place of worship right yeah 
I think, uh, Nancy, I think there's a whole lot here. And I know that next chapter, we step into talking quite a bit more about Cyrus and about this wow. plan of God for the people. Uh, is there anything else that you have to say about this part? Um, I think that's, that's it. I mean, just the reminder, right, in those last four verses, um, God is saying, yeah, just remember who I am, right? I'm the one that created you. I'm the one that did all these things. And only God, um, through who God chooses, right, will restore things to God's intent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think just that reminder, right, so that we don't get too caught up in um, our egos of, of what we've done. I'm a good person. <laughs> I am good because God created me good and I'm redeemed because of what Jesus did. Absolutely. Okay. I can't rest on my own power. Absolutely. Well, I, I um, yeah, for all of us struggling with our own sin and difficulty and struggling with the idea of redemption, it reminds me of uh, Johnny Cash's line, my arms aren't long enough to box with God. And yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Bring God's greatness. Okay. Well, folks, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We're very glad that we had the opportunity to do our Bible study with you today. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's always a joy for Nancy and I to be able to get together and to be able to talk about the Bible, both with one another and to be able to share that with mm -hmm. you. So we hope that through this, that you are encouraged and uh, that the scriptures are opened and you are inspired to go searching and looking for yourself as well. Uh, God is there present, and he's here with us speaking and with you wherever you are. So God bless you this day, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.